planet is a never-ending wonder. A million years would barely suffice to see all the sites nature has curated, and it would take another billion to truly comprehend their machinations and ecosystems. So, in our human shackles, we can but watch and try to use our time to admire these gardens of life while we are able to. Today, we will look at one of the most active corners of our globe. The New World, the expanse only recently discovered through the efforts of the Hunter's Guild. This massive continent and its surrounding islands have been the subject of much guild and research activity, and present a perfect place to experience the splendor of our world. This is in no small part due to the staggering diversity of the wildlife. From endemic unicates to familiar faces, the New World is home to over 70 large monsters, all with their own place in the ecosystem. In this documentary film, we will pay each of them a visit, discovering the miraculous and fascinating ways in which they live in this biological paradise. While every single one of them could and probably will fill their very own documentary episode, this film will serve as an extensive overview of all the wonders the new world has to offer. The New World is, maybe more than any other place on Earth, defined by bioenergy. This mysterious resource that dwells within all living beings circulates through the continent and influences all that it touches. As they are born and live, creatures accumulate bioenergy and nurture it all around the New World. Once death is imminent, they undertake a pilgrimage to the Rotten Vale, where they die and deliver their collected bioenergy onto the earth once more. The effluvium reclaims the physical nutrients and sends them up to the coral highlands, while the ephemeral bioenergy seeps into the Everstream, the subterranean blood vessels of the continent, which send the energy across their network in order to create and maintain life all across the new world. This process is, naturally, many times more explosive and violent when an elder dragon dies, as they carry magnitudes more bioenergy than the average creature. Their demise flushes every ecosystem with new life. But sometimes, that is not all that happens. Recent research done by the guild revealed that the bioenergy of the elder dragons is somewhat different than that of other animals, essentially being comprised of two components. Bioenergy, identical to the one found in everything else, and a secondary type of energy that is much more concentrated and dense. It has tentatively been named pure energy. While regular bioenergy permeates the land through the Everstream, pure energy generally doesn't travel that far. Either due to its density or another factor altogether, this special type of bioenergy tends to instead accumulate in specific areas, in a sense being washed ashore by the Everstream. Only one such area has thus far been mapped. The Elder's Recess. North of the Great Ravine stretches a massive mountain range of black minerals like basalt. It is estimated that the entire northern region of the continent is covered by this rocky, inhospitable biome, and so, guild efforts to map it were fairly unenthusiastic at first. However, among the endless dark rock, one area stands out, as enormous luminescent crystal structures jot out from the mountains. This is the Elder's Recess, a congregation of pure Elder Dragon energy. That energy is washed into the rocks through the Everstream and, in a process not yet fully understood, causes the rapid growth of enormous crystalline structures, which can very well be considered bioenergy made manifest. 
Every single crystal was, in a very real way, once an elder dragon, and all that remains is this shiny, smooth legacy. Over time, these crystals grow much like trees and spread across the land, breaking and reshaping the rock around it. The recess is, thanks to these crystals, a hotbed for bioenergy and has thus become a battleground for some of the new world's most fierce warriors. Be it deep inside the lava caverns or high above the mountaintops, the recess is always the site for some of the harshest competition on the continent, be it territorial, temporary traversal, or even resource motivated. At the center sits the locale's most imposing monument, an enormous mega crystal, many times larger than any others. While it is assumed it formed when the ancestral Dalamadur, who now rests in the Vale, met its end and released its unimaginable amounts of bioenergy, its exact origins are still contested. But what is undeniable is that this central pillar unites the atmosphere of the recess into a cold, brutal reverence, a rocky arena where only the mightiest may shine in the splendor of the giants that came before. In fact, one awestruck researcher is even quoted as saying, It is no exaggeration to call the Elder's Recess a giant natural shrine. A key element that differentiates the recess from other explored areas is that it houses only very few endemic species. While some monsters have only been spotted here, with many of them it is assumed that their actual habitat lies somewhere else, perhaps deeper in the mountains. The specifics, however, will remain speculation for now, as the central authority of the Hunter's Guild, the city of Nandorma, has not authorized the exploration of any land north of the recess. This decision was based on the observation that the further north one penetrates into the new world, the more dangerous the environments become, far too dangerous for the satellite group of the research commission and their limited resources. The Elder's Recess is already so treacherous that only hunters of the illustrious high rank qualification, or above, are allowed to venture there. Thus, the periodic congregation of powerful monsters is the only real glimpse we can get of what the northern continent might be like. That does not, however, mean that we are unable to observe at least some northern creatures in their natural habitat. While there are only a few native species in the area, at least one of them is both easy and pleasant to observe. All across the recess, the corpulent Dodogama trots around, unbothered by the magma and the fiery explosions. This chubby fanged wyvern patrols every nook and cranny of the lower areas, in search of an unusual food source, the very crystals that define this landscape. Calling what the Dodogama does to these crystals eating is however a tad misleading. The beast does indeed ingest the crystals and use them as fuel, but instead of classic digestion, the Dodogama absorbs the bioenergy right out of the crystals that sit in its gut, spitting out the remains as darkened dead rock. This chemical extraction is so efficient that the creature doesn't actually have to ingest pure crystalline material. It can also just gobble up the dark basalt rock that makes up the floors and walls of the recess and absorb the traces of bioenergy that merged with them through the proximity to the actual crystals. In order to carve out rock and crystal alike, the Dodogama developed an intensely specialized jaw. This massive apparatus is adorned with vertical rows of hard shell spines, which can cut through solid stone effortlessly. It also can not only open up vertically, like most large-scale jaws, but it can also expand horizontally in order to allow more chewed rock to be dug up and stored in the jaw. This complex and heavy adaptation makes up over 30% of the Dodogama's body mass, and thus much of its neck and upper body musculature is made specifically to support it. The only downside of this rock-munching strategy is temperature. The process of extracting highly concentrated energy out of uncatalyzed rock is highly intensive and highly exothermic, meaning that it releases massive amounts of heat. The Dodogama's average body temperature is already higher than with most organisms in order to catalyze and speed up these chemical reactions, 
so having it heat up even more would almost certainly be deadly. The wyvern thus developed a simple but effective solution. Its tummy. By expanding specialized skin sacs around its abdomen, the dodogama hangs out its belly and thus increases the surface area of its body that is in contact with the cool rocky floor of the recess. This allows for its excess body heat to easily be funneled and dissipated into the ground below the beast, enabling safe yet speedy absorption of its ingested bioenergy. The Dodogama doesn't hunt, and its hard-shelled body is both difficult and pointless to pierce, since much of its mass is made up from indigestible material to most other monsters. Due to this, the Dodogama has little need for offensive capabilities, as it generally isn't considered worth the effort of harassment. In the rare, hostile occasion however, the Fanged Wyvern is more than capable of defending itself. Despite its plumpy exterior, the Dodogama can dart around at impressive speeds, which it does with its jaw wide open, ready to deliver a devastating bite to anything in its way. But this is only a feint. The true danger isn't the bite at all, but rather the friction of the jaw scraping against the rocky floor. As it runs, the Dodogama grinds the rock into fine dust, which, when mixed with droplets of its saliva, turn into an almost invisible, explosive mist, capable of harming targets that thought they dodged a more obvious assault. And even if this detonative fog can be avoided, one still isn't safe. As it scrapes across the rock, the Dodogama ingests the stone it grinds and begins extracting bioenergy from it, raising its body heat to smoldering degrees. Not only does this replenish the Dodogama's strength continuously, it also arms it. The rocky remains of the chemical process in its belly are red hot and, when mixed with the beast's saliva, can also detonate. Thus, once it has a mouthful of stone, the Dodogama can launch fiery projectiles from its maw while continuously recharging energy. Its only weakness is that the rock stored in its mouth can also explode inside of its mouth if hit by an outside force hard enough. While the Dodogama is the only permanent resident of the recess, he is not the only one interested in a bioenergy stored in stone. Other monsters, which are otherwise capable of digesting rock, have been found to migrate to the recess regularly to feed on the high energy rocks. One such monster is the Uragan, the brute wyvern closely related to the Rotten Vale's Radoban, and thus part of the Hammer Wyvern group. This gilded behemoth is a familiar face to the guild, as it has long since been studied and observed patrolling the volcanic regions of the Old World. Their presence in the New World has only been periodically confirmed in the Elder's Recess though. As a species that is well known for eating rocks as their main source of energy, the Uragan's appearance in the recess is not exactly surprising. What is surprising however is just how well it manages to fit into the area, almost as if it had adapted specifically to this region, despite showing virtually no differences in the New World versus its Old World representatives. The Hammer Wyvern's signature rolling ability is heavily augmented in the Uragan, who traded speed and elegance for power and mass. Barreling around the basalt, the beast can not only deftly maneuver the cave networks and slopes of the recess, it can even carve out entirely new paths. One tunnel in the explored area in particular was almost definitely created by generations of Uragan, as they now tend to sleep and nest there during their stay in the recess. Just like the Radoban, the Uragan prefers to nest on top of a bed of tar. While it does not cover itself completely at birth like its cousin, the Uragan does regularly apply a coat of black tar on its underbelly, for a very specific purpose. While the digestive system of the Uragan has no trouble extracting nutrients from rocks, it can always go faster. So, with the help of the tar, the Uragan sticks particularly large rocks onto itself and grinds them continuously as it rolls, heating them up and breaking them down continuously. After the right amount of time, the Uragan will then ingest the rocks stuck to its underside, which will be digested in a fraction of the time. 
This means that the lower skin of the beast essentially functions as a secondary, external precursor stomach, which can work in parallel with the internal, main stomach, thus raising digestive efficiency tremendously. The rocks stuck to the Uragan's body also do not impact its rolling ability. On its back, the Uragan is adorned with rows of rocky protrusions, which grow and harden all throughout its life and can actually be used to determine an Uragan's age. These protrusions grant stability during rolling, almost working as a sort of guide rail for balance. The tough body armor of the Uragan makes it a fairly undesirable target, but should it ever feel threatened nonetheless, it does have a few tricks up its sleeves. The main one being its enormous chin, which puts the hammer in Hammer Wyvern. While its enormous weight makes it a slow weapon, a single connecting hit is more than enough to pulverize any poor soul on the receiving end. This deadly mallet is made more powerful by continuously fusing it with molten ore, a process that increases both size and mass. This is not only done for the purposes of aggression, but also for mating privileges, as bigger, more metallic chins are considered attractive. One can even observe the difference in color between the Uragan's natural skin and the molten ore that is not actually part of the main body. Should the chin not suffice, the Uragan is still not out of options. As a hammer wyvern, its digestion of rocks and minerals produces different kinds of gases as a byproduct, which need to be emitted through vents on the beast's underside regularly. These gases are not just harmless gusts, however, they have various adverse effects on any inhaler or bystander, and the Uragan instinctively knows this. It can time the gas expulsion and choose what kind of gas to emit, be it a fiery hot vapor or a soporific gas like the Radoban, using this natural process as a trump card. If even this fails, there is one more thing the Uragan can, reluctantly, do. The rocks that hang on its underside, being pre-digested mechanically, heat up substantially during that process, eventually even becoming explosive due to the buildup of heat. In a pinch, the Uragan can swing its tail to hurl those explosive rocks at its foes. A very effective move, but one the Wyvern will not do until pressed, as it doesn't want to miss out on the snacks it collected. Despite being a mobile and very capable creature, the Uragan cannot venture across the entire recess. Like with most areas of the new continent, the Elder's Recess localized environment split the area into distinct zones not all of which are easily traversed by each monster. The rocky corridors of the middle plane are perfect for a rolling Uragan, as they feature gentle slopes and wide open areas. And while it cannot go too deep, the lava caverns of the lowest plane are also somewhat accessible to it. The highest plane, however, the skybound crags, are reserved for highly nimble or flying beasts, as their steep cliffs and elevations squarely reject the Uragan. It is not the most limited monster in terms of habitat, though. In the deepest depths of the lava caverns dwells a Piscine wyvern so perfectly adapted to the magma that it, ironically, cannot thrive anywhere but the most hostile infernos. The Lavasioth is a familiar, and unpleasant, sight to any hunter who has ever explored the fiery mountains of the Old World. Its dark, unnaturally hard shelling is the stuff of legends, even being able to deflect the sharpest of blades, and its mastery over magma is unparalleled. This mastery stems from the Lavasio spending almost its entire life entirely immersed in lava, swimming through it as a fish would through a pond. It can manipulate the lava currents around it to sprout upwards and splash onto its enemies, or it can even spit out fireballs itself. Its golden skin is highly fire resistant and also hidden most of the time as the Lavasioth continuously covers itself in magma, which hardens and becomes a suit of impenetrable black armor. This defense is only weakened while and shortly after swimming in lava, as the armor melts and softens. This is where the guild advises hunters to strike. 
Due to these abilities and its extremely aggressive behavior, not much is actually known about the Lavasioth. One key discovery, however, has recently been made, thanks to its new world cousin, the Juratodos. While the Lavasioth was discovered many years before the Juratodos, the latter's skeleton was found to be extremely primitive, suggesting that the Juratodos is perhaps the oldest remaining Piscean wyvern. And because it is predominantly found in the New World, with only a tiny migratory population near the Kamura region being the exception, it has been proposed that Piscean wyverns as a whole might have actually emerged originally in the New World. The Lavasioth might originate from the recess and the specimens found in the Old World might be the result of later migrations. Regardless of the ultimate veracity of this hypothesis, it is an interesting glimpse of how the habit of calling them the Old and New World respectively can create biases that nature does not conform to. The Lavasioth's aggression is, luckily for the area, completely entrapped within the lava lakes of the lower caverns, and thus its impact on the recess is fairly limited. This is not the case for the apex species of the area, of which there are surprisingly many. As a meeting point for the continent's strongest, the Elder's Recess regularly receives visits by some true conquerors of the ecosystem, beasts of unimaginable power. One such visitor is the Brute Fist Wyvern, the Brachidios. This massive brute is, like Lavasioth, well known and well feared among the guild, but unlike the Lavasioth, its bipedal build allows it to terrorize a vast area of the recess, including both the caverns and the middle plains. The Brachidios stands apart from other brute wyverns due to its arms. Instead of the stubby limbs the classification is known for, this brute wyvern has strong, muscular forelimbs armed with large, sharp claws. But those claws aren't the fascinating part. On the back of the monster's hands grow hard, massive shell structures called pounders, which jot forward like battering rams. This same structure is also repeated on the beast's cranium. These pounders are extremely deadly, as their impact force is immense. And somehow, this isn't even close to being the Brachidios' most bizarre weapon. The Brachidios' most interesting feature has, curiously, nothing to do with the wyvern itself directly. All over its body, but most concentrated around its pounders and horn, it is covered in a fungus called slime mold. This mold is capable of immensely fast reproduction, but at a cost. The energy required for its millions of cell divisions creates heat and gas, which puts the mold into a state similar of that of glycerin, where it remains at risk of detonation through oxygenation or even just physical impact. Even worse, given time, these reactions add up, to the point where the accumulation of heat and gas becomes visible on the mold itself, with its color going from green to yellow to red. And while the mold does benefit from exploding, as it spreads the fungus spores into the air and allows long distance proliferation, exploding continuously and randomly during any and all selectivity would be disadvantageous for any organism. This is where the Brachidios comes in, forming a symbiosis with the slime mold. The Brachidios evolved to have its shell be coated with a binding agent, an agent that allows the slime mold to peacefully exist on the shell without having to worry about spontaneous ignition. In an act of what romantics would call immense trust, the mold gave up control over the actual timing and severity of its explosive procreation to the Brachidios, who developed an hormonal gland dedicated to commandeering this fungus' fate. When activated, that gland releases a hormone into the Brachidios' saliva and shell coating, which primes and activates the mold's cellular activity. During the Brachidios' movements and actions, the active mold detaches from its body and explodes in small piles, ensuring proliferation without endangering the entire fungus colony. Thus, the mold completely circumvents its explosive unpredictability and ensures regular and safe long-distance procreation, 
as well as a self-protecting home base with little to fear in form of threats. Antibrachidios can use the slime and the residues of its explosions as a way to mark its territory, a warning to any would-be trespassers. But more than that, the Brachidios gains access to a tremendously potent weapon, the slime mold's explosions. An attacker might be fast, armored, heat resistant or cunning, but almost none possess the specific resistances to deal with a sticky, heated substance that explodes on their skin, not just shredding tissue and singeing fur, but sending deadly vibrations into the body, pairing very badly with sensitive, fleshy organs. What was the slime mold's biggest weakness becomes, through symbiosis, the Brachidios' strongest weapon. Now, every attack that would have been dangerous through the mass and force of the beast's pounders alone is turned into a meteor of death and fire, as the slime mold congregates on the beast's arms and turns its punches into flaming novas. Activated into a detonative state by the beast's saliva through licking, it becomes a key element to the Brachidios' arsenal. The Brachidios has even developed a specialized tongue tip to properly coat its pounders during this process. Moreover, and maybe more deadly, the Brachidios can now strategically lay traps and control the terrain around it by allowing the mold to drop off in its active state after each attack. Simultaneously, the Brachidios can spread weak amounts of both spores and its activating hormone through the air around it, allowing for slime to appear seemingly out of nowhere and explode immediately. This turns the Brachidios into a deadly opponent, as its already fierce temperament and territorial aggression is combined with an ability so destructive that even apex predators regularly see themselves retreating. Many fights, the Brachidios can just win through the use of brute force alone, with the slime mold only adding auxiliary explosions. However, should the Brachidios find itself cornered and stressed, the resulting flood in hormones, all including the slime mold activator, causes the mold all over its body to grow and increase rapidly, preparing itself for stronger and bigger explosions. In this state, the slime mold is primed to explode much quicker and thus presents an even greater threat. However, the Brachidios is careful to regulate the use of this state and the explosions in general, as it is only resistant to them, not immune. It speaks to the immense harshness of the area that the Brachidios' fiery rage isn't really an anomaly in the Elder's recess. This eternal battleground is shaken regularly by the fiercest of aggressors, and some develop specifically in order to compete in this most sacred of arenas. The seeding basil geese is one such case, a variant of a basil geese which has changed profoundly due to the increased stresses of the Elder's recess. This variant may seem a tad more timid than its regular species, as it doesn't invade other locales, but appearances can be very deceiving. In actuality, the seething basil geese is a cunning tactician, always calculating and planning how and when to strike. And when that time comes, its destructive potential is nigh on unrivaled. It retains all of its charges, stomps and headbutts from the regular species, including of course the explosive liquid which hardens into scale-like bombs and drops from the monster when desired. However, the more intense battles fought in the Elder's Recess have, over time, caused this basil geese to react more strongly to adrenaline and other stress hormones, to the point where the glands which produce its explosive liquid change their function after enough of those hormones are released. The longer the stress lasts, the purer the explosive liquid secreted by those glands becomes, until it turns from its usual brown to a bright neon pink, at which point its explosive potential reaches its zenith. Now, the bombs of the basil geese are vicious and sticky, adhering themselves anywhere and expanding until detonation is imminent. Not all body parts begin producing these bombs at the same time though, but once they do, the basil geese becomes a walking inferno, every movement triggering enormous explosions. While this will push back most attackers, the basil geese cannot keep this up for long. Neither the heart-straining stress hormones nor the continuous explosions are particularly healthy after all. 
as a variant, seething basil geese are fairly rare, since each regular basil geese has to turn into one individually virtually at random. Thus, while they are more than capable of thriving in the recess individually, they are too sporadic in appearance to really make an impact. Variants are in general less impactful to environments as it is extraordinarily difficult for a large population of them to form. In terms of ecological impact and salience, the clear winners are the subspecies, which see their adaptations change on a genetic level, allowing them to multiply and establish successful proper populations. And the recess has its own dominant subspecies, the ebony odogaran. While the regular species is completely confined to the rotten veil, the ebony odogaran is a nomad, capable of thriving in any environment. The guild has however concluded that the genetic split and subsequent evolution into this subspecies happened here, in the elder's recess. Like with the basil geese, it is assumed that a lost population of Odogaran responded to the immense competitive pressure of the recess, as suddenly finding itself surrounded by apex species and elder dragons alike must have been quite a shock. Somehow, the population did survive long enough to adapt, exchanging the fleshy red coat for a jet black exterior. The ebony odogaran is in many ways identical to the regular odogaran, inheriting its unique claw structure, its modified neural network, and its specialized nose. Its differentiating adaptation is also what leads researchers to believe it originated in the recess. At some point, the ebony odogaran developed a dragon sac, an organ which produces dragon energy. This dark, charged mist is a mysterious kind of energy that is only found within the bodies of a select few monsters, and it can only be generated through organic means. While its origins are still mysterious, its purpose became clear almost immediately. Dragon energy can nullify elemental attacks, snuffing out fire and vaporizing ice with ease. It has sometimes been called the anti-element. But more crucially, it is the only substance capable of sealing away the abilities of elder dragons, reducing the power considerably through contact. The ebony odogaran thus likely developed its dragon sac as a response to the pronounced presence of elder dragons within the recess. Armed with this new weapon, the ebony odogaran enhances all of its physical abilities with draconic energy, letting it course through its body and increasing its general strength many fold. This is however also where this subspecies reveals how recently it must have emerged. While it can roughly use the energy, its actual mastery over it is fairly limited, only being capable of having it crudely billow out of its skin and mouth. It has not yet evolved any specialized musculature to direct and launch its dragon energy. It has however found a workaround solution in the meantime. By chewing on chunks of meat for an extended period of time, it seeps them in dragon energy within its mouth, as it penetrates flesh very easily. Those chunks can then be spit at an opponent, allowing the dragon element to, in a roundabout way, to be launched as a projectile. While these adaptations and emergent species can be extremely successful, it is often the old, tried and true veterans of the ecosystem that truly thrive. A trick that has carried a species through eons of ecological pressure must be effective indeed. And one such trick is ceaseless violence, and its indisputed master is the Rajang. This nomadic monster inhabits only the remotest areas of the world, and seems to prefer volcanic regions. It is considered the strongest fanged beast, a title made fact by the observation that it is the only known non-elder dragon that specifically hunts elder dragons. More specifically, Rajang hunt the Kirin, stalking them for miles upon miles. The reason for this is one of nature's most incredible events. Rajang are walking tanks, sentient masses of pure muscle capable of unspeakable acts of cruel violence. Few beings can hope to match the ferocity and strength of the fiercely territorial Rajang, as it pounds and leaps across the battleground. 
but even that isn't even close to its true power. Juvenile Rajang are born with a thunder sack that can convert consumed calories into electricity. They have, at first, only limited control over it, and mostly just use it to stockpile electric charges in the fur on their back. This fur is made up of still living, elongated cells that store the electricity outside and away from the Rajang's internal organs, locked behind semi-permeable membranes. A young Rajang is mostly incapable of properly using its thunder abilities, and so this storage is a safety mechanism, a key aspect of the thunder trade-off hypothesis. This hypothesis was postulated after researchers observed that most non-Elder Dragon creatures that use the thunder element can only either store or control the thunder by themselves, but not both, and that one half of the process is often outsourced to an external trigger or symbiote. The hypothesis thus proposes that this phenomenon is caused by the thunder element's unique property. It is electricity based, and thus could cause catastrophic damage to the user's nerve system if it were to go out of control. So, most thunder based monsters find a workaround to externalize either the production, storage or control of the thunder element, thus reducing the risk of a fatal misfire. The Rajang's solution to this is quite unique indeed. A juvenile Rajang will only rarely attempt to use its thunder, instead focusing on growing bigger and stronger. Once it reaches a certain size, the Rajang sets out on a dangerous pilgrimage. A hunt for a Kirin. This coming of age ritual success depends entirely on if the Rajang can successfully subdue a Kirin and, in a truly barbaric act, rip out its horn and consume it. What exactly happens next is unknown, but presumably the mysterious minerals in the horn, which allowed the Kirin the most precise thunder control in the animal kingdom, fuse with the Rajang's body and permanently alter it, finally granting it full, safe control over its thunder element. Once unleashed, this true power is tremendous. Now, the Rajan can open the membranes in its fur and allow thunder to freely course through its body, turning its coat into an electrifying gold aura. In this state, it can shoot off beams, blasts and bursts of electricity, as well as enhance all of its already incredible physical abilities. Should that still not suffice, it can feed the thunder directly into the muscles in its arms, causing them to balloon up and harden. This turns the Rajang's arms hard as steel, which makes them effective in both defense and offense. The only weakness of this thunder mode is that it can be forced off. Should the Rajang suffer damage to its tail, the pain can cause a spinal reflex that disables the thunder sack for a short time. And the Rajang of the New World must be ready to face their weaknesses, as the Elder's Recess is home to many creatures that can nonetheless challenge it. First and foremost, it is a gathering spot for Elder Dragons, an unheard phenomenon in the Old World. Here, almost every Elder Dragon confirmed to exist on the New Continent appears at least occasionally in the recess, eager to nourish themselves on a the concentrated, crystalline bioenergy. But while these migrations are common, very few Elder Dragons actually nest and live in the recess. One of those few is the Kushala Daora, the Tempest of Winds and well-known Scourge of the Old World. These flying elder dragons are among the most well-researched members of the classification, and as such were quickly tracked down and observed in the New World. Their unmistakable metallic exoskeleton shines as brightly here as it does across the ocean. This skin is also instrumental in tracking the Kushala's territory, as it has to be shed throughout the creature's life. An area inhabited by a Kushala Daora will thus have these discarded, rusted suits of armor laying around. And the New World Kushala have certainly made the Elder's Recess their home, inhabiting its highest peaks and nesting among the clouds in the skybound crags. They strut about carelessly, eating the minerals and crystals in the rock and occasionally preying on the weaker monsters in the area. As an elder dragon, it has virtually nothing to fear. 
Its metallic hide is nigh on impenetrable, growing sturdier and thicker with each shed. In fact, this hide is the only actual threat to the Kushala's life. The Elder Dragon's body is, through an unknown process, always accumulating metal and minerals to coat the various body parts of the Kushala. In advanced age, however, this process has a high likelihood of misfiring and often begins coating the beast's internal organs with metal, eventually causing its death as its vital organs shut down, heavy with steel. This is considered one of the few researched natural deaths of any elder dragon. Should anything be foolish enough to anger Kushala Daora nonetheless, it will unleash its signature ability its utter and total control over wind. It is a dragon said to ride the storm, and that is not inaccurate. The Kushala Daora possesses a mysterious organ that allows it to create strong wind currents around its body, which can be used for a variety of purposes. For one, they can be emitted through the skin and cover the monster in a rapidly circulating torrent of gales, which is strong enough to even deflect bullets. This also aids in mobility. The Kushala Daora is, due to its metal exoskeleton, actually too heavy to fly normally, so it can only take off by having its own winds create updrafts under its massive wings. Alternatively, the wind can also be emitted explosively from those wings, allowing them to create twisters and tornadoes. Or, more directly, the Kushala can spew out the wind, using its mouth as a pressurized wind cannon. Its teeth are arranged such that they optimize the aerodynamism of this air nozzle. This ability, like many Elder Dragon abilities, defies understanding, but a few key factors have been mapped. The wind producing organ is extremely susceptible to infection and inflammation, meaning that the Kushala is not only easily poisoned, but that poison will also drastically reduce the amount of wind it can produce. Additionally, numerous reports have indicated that if the two frontmost horns of the Kushala Daora's heads are broken, it will no longer be able to control tornadoes and more complex wind structures, implying that they are vital to more precise wind control. They are theorized to work through electromagnetism. In most ecosystems, the local elder dragon stands at the top of the food chain and must not fear any harassment. While isolated species like the Rajang can go after specific elder dragons, there are virtually no beings that pose a general threat to the entire classification. Well, none, except one. One dweller of the new world is bold enough to challenge the elder dragons, strong enough to rip their flesh asunder, and persistent enough to hunt and haunt them. The Nergigante. This flying monster, an elder dragon itself, almost exclusively hunts and preys on other elder dragons, killing them not with some mysterious ability, but through pure physical strength and sheer unrelenting aggression. Be it its massive horns, its tails or its claws, every inch of the Nergigante is a deadly weapon, ready to strike at any moment. It is by far one of the most aggressive creatures the guild has ever discovered, as it has almost never been observed outside of combat. The beast's most apparent feature, however, are the multiple spikes growing from its skin. These spikes, of which a Nergigante typically has around 1800, undergo a rapid and fascinating life cycle. They grow continuously, and first emerge as soft, flexible white spines. In this state, they are fairly brittle and will easily break. As they remain in contact with air, however, they do not only grow but harden and stiffen, turning black in the process. In this state, they deflect most attacks and serve as the Nergigante's armor. They do, however, also get quite heavy and slow the beast down, and so the Nergigante has developed a trick to shed them all at once. 
Once a majority of its spikes have blackened, the Nargigante, almost definitely currently locked in combat, will jump high into the air and dive bomb its target. Usually, flying creatures avoid crashing as an attack strategy, as the hollow bones required for traditional flight are too fragile to survive collisions. But once covered in its spiked armor, the Nergigante can use this for one devastating crash, both shedding all of its spikes and regaining its speed, and dealing catastrophic damage to its opponent. The weight of the spikes might also be what motivates some of the beast's aggression, since it needs to shed off the extra weight. But one must ask, why? Why is the Nergigante so hell-bent on hunting other Elder Dragons specifically? The answer is the same as to why and how the Elder's recess developed in the first place. Bioenergy Nergigante exclusively feeds on bioenergy, and not just any. Only the purest energy will do, and so it relentlessly hunts elder dragons in order to absorb the pure energy they contain. It then uses this energy to reproduce, but not in the way the guild expected. As a large eukaryote, the Nergigante should, by all means, reproduce sexually, having two individuals combine two half sets of the DNA into a zygote, which then develops into a juvenile. But this is not the case. Instead, Nergigante are genderless, and turn the bioenergy they absorb into fully fledged zygotes already within their body, each of them already having a full set of DNA identical to their singular parent. Those zygotes are then implanted into the spikes of the Nergigante. When those fertilized spikes break off and fall into a suitably protected spot, they slowly grow into a juvenile Nergigante, an identical clone of its parent. This asexual reproduction allows for continuous population of Nergigante to terrorize the elder dragons of the new world, and it has been suggested that this species emerged specifically to balance the ecosystem and keep the elder dragons, who migrate towards the Rotten Vale and the Recess, in check. Life finds a way. Even in the Elder's Recess, a volcanic desert of unimaginable conflict, many species live and thrive in their own unique ways. Those ways may be violent, they may be ugly, but they too are just part of natural life. Here, among the magma and the basalt, Life nonetheless journeys on, finds solutions, surpasses limits. Even the fiercest battleground is just another place of the immutable touch of Mother Nature. Thank you all so much for watching. I would not be able to make these videos without your continuous support. Uh, if you wish to see these videos a little bit earlier than everyone else, you can always pledge to Patron, because that's a new perk that we've got there. And speaking of Patrons, a very special thank you to all of you especially, including, of course, Fiction Ape, Mr. Game, Sini, Courage, Alex, Elliot Brady, Iron Camel, Jameson Tate, Ludenther, Paracha, Perro Skoko, Project Iceman, That's Just Ash, Mr. Meander, and Geo. Thank you once again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, be safe, wash your hands, and take care. Bye-bye.